Ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor to be here today. I was asked to share my thoughts on health and mental well-being in the Arctic, and as I started preparing for the lecture, I you know, read up on the topic, revise slides and graphs. The same memory of a patient I once had kept popping up in my mind and interfering. I think the reason I kept thinking about this person is because of her challenges, which were in many ways challenges that people all over the Arctic face. So I would like to tell you her story briefly. More than 20 years ago, I was working first as a general doctor in a remote area of Iceland, northern Iceland, and then as a junior doctor in the psychiatric department of our national hospital, Landspital in Reykjavik. In both roles, I came across this middle-aged lady that I remember so well. She was a farmer from a remote valley. She lived alone on a farm in a valley where once many farmers had lived, but she was the last one at that time. She had been married, but her husband had passed away more than 10 years previously. They had had one child, a son, but a few years before he had, in his late teens, committed suicide while working away from the farm. From that day on, around the anniversary of her son's passing every year, she became depressed and bedbound for one or two months and had to be admitted to the hospital in Reykjavik, some 500 kilometers away. I remember that apart from the sad regularity of her admissions, the logistics of getting help to her in a remote valley 160 kilometers from the nearest town, and then the logistics of bringing her to Reykjavik were quite a challenge. And I remember finding it strange that there didn't seem to be any way of preventing things repeating themselves, of supporting her at home or mending her problems. The tale of this uh, <clears throat> lady highlights a number of issues that are, that are at least as relevant now as they were 20 years ago. Issues that we are struggling with all over the Arctic, although some of the issues are particularly challenging in indigenous populations. This woman, she suffered from a mental illness, depression, but her, uh, the underlying reason for this was the tragic suicide of a young man. There is no denying the fact that suicides, especially youth suicides, are a major epidemic in Arctic regions. I use the word epidemic both because suicides are so common in many, particularly indigenous communities, but also because this is a relatively recent thing which has grown exponentially. If we look at Greenland until the 1960s, for example, Suicides were rare events in traditional communities. It is not entirely clear what has happened since, and it is certainly not possible to put a finger on one or two causes, but the transition from traditional societies to modern times has proved very difficult for many communities. As early as 1985, Watton was reporting in Canada's north around 60 suicides per 100,000 population per year in indigenous populations, compared to 13.5 per 100,000 in the general Canadian population, and a rate of up to 300 per 100,000 in 15 to 24-year-old men in some areas. Although obviously huge variations exist, the overall picture has not improved. In the 1990s, suicide rates of 500 per 100,000 per year were reported by Bjergård in parts of Greenland. So what can explain this? Reasons mentioned in the literature include poverty, childhood separation and loss, accessibility to firearms, alcohol abuse and dependence, a history of personal and familial health problems, and past sexual or physical abuse. But behind all of this, there is a story of people who have, within a very brief period, 50 years or less, lost their traditional way of living. It is a story of disrupted communities, of families falling apart and of young generations struggling to find purpose. It is also a story of unemployment, particularly youth unemployment, which is toxic for any community. And looking into individual cases, we are faced with a massive mountain of undiagnosed, untreated, and unmet social and mental health issues. Wherever we look, we see the same pattern, although reports differ somewhat. Large pockets in Greenland, in Canada, in Alaska, in Siberia, all the same, the same high, although variable suicide rate, the same youthful pattern. It is a major issue. Simple explanations do not suffice, but the problem is real and it must be dealt with. A second issue that the story I mentioned in the beginning brings up is the issue of logistics. The challenge of trying to bring support 
to someone who lives in a remote area far away from professional help. Such a person is less likely to have mental health and social needs noticed, and hence less likely to have those same needs met. This is something we see in remote areas of Iceland, and there is no reason to believe it is different in other parts of the Arctic, on the contrary. Although certain mental health problems are less common in remote rural areas, other problems are more common, and people in remote areas are far less likely to receive help and support. Help that we know could improve their lives and sometimes even save their lives. How can we as communities address these issues, provide support and help in areas with great distances and limited resources? Telemedicine is certainly one way. Evidence shows that assessments and therapy sessions delivered via remote telemeetings equipment are as useful as if delivered face to face. There is certainly much help in this and the technology is becoming easier to use all the time. I wouldn't overemphasize the use of this technology, however. Such sessions are helpful to diagnose and maintain well-known mental health problems, but they do not substitute social and mental health support locally. What is truly needed in the long run is to build up mental health expertise. Technology can help make better use of resources, but it cannot replace good organization and adequate resources. So coming back to the story I started with, the lady I told you about before had to move away from her farm in the end. The reason wasn't just her mental illness. It was a combination of things, a part of the long-term trend that sees populations move from rural to urban settings. But would we deal differently with her problems today? Well, we could possibly use telecommunications more effectively, Skype or some equivalent of that to monitor her better. But apart from that, I'm not sure we are much closer to managing her problems now than 20 years ago. It is a major challenge to think towards the future, how we can properly understand the issues and challenges faced by remote communities, build up collaboration, use new technologies intelligently, both to help clinical staff, but also to bring together widely dispersed centers of knowledge from all around the Arctic. I would like to bring up Bo Cunberry's report from 2014, which some of you may know of. It focuses Nordic collaboration in health, it's an excellent and intelligent report, and from it, the Arctic region as a whole can draw many lessons on how to collaborate on major issues. I don't have time to go through its recommendations, but some of them are highlighted here. All of these proposals are highly relevant within the Arctic region as a whole, and we should look towards learning from this report. This is a photograph showing smiley sticks. It's an initiative staff and patients of mental health services in Iceland started a few years back. The woman in the middle there is Ásta Ragnar Jóhannesdóttir, the then head of parliament. The initiative was about smiling in the face of stigma and adversity and collecting funds to improve conditions on our psychiatric wards. It was hugely successful, not only in collecting money. No, the, benefits, the main benefits were the open dialogue and sense of community this work brought to those involved. And that brings me back to the question, how can we start addressing the challenges mental health issues in the Arctic face? One of the biggest problems is being alone with the problem. The individual is often terribly isolated with sadness and loss. How can we reach out to that person? The foundation of that support has to be in the local community, even if it's just a tiny village. There, we will need to train people locally, not only health workers, but also people who can act as anchors, as rocks in the society. And the way to reach them is through awareness campaigns in an effort to lift the stigma of mental health and addiction problems. We need to build up resilience and knowledge in the local communities to a far greater extent than currently is done. But on a larger scale, we also need to train far more health professionals, psychiatrists, psychologists, mental health nurses, and social workers who can then use information technology and regular visits to communicate with, train, and support staff on the ground locally. We at the National Hospital in Reykjavik have been willing to accept students, for example, for training from Greenland, and we take seriously our role as an important source of knowledge and professionals in the region, in the West Nordic region. But it's also obvious to me, coming to this Arctic Circle Forum, that strength lies in the numbers and in the communication provided here. The Arctic region is vast and it's sparsely populated. It's not just individuals and families that are along with the challenge and stigma of mental health problems. It is also small villages, small towns, and small countries. Addressing these issues on a regional level, leveraging the ideas and resources of the whole Arctic region is needed to tackle those issues. Mental health problems, addiction problems, lacks, lack of roles, suicides, and we have no choice but to work together.
Thank you.